I don't hear me. Normally I hear me. You hear me. Why don't you get this out of my way? Cheryl, thank you. Thank you. Dago, thank you, wherever you're sitting. Thank you for this invitation. And thank everybody. So, you know, uh, let me preface my little talk with my elevator talk that, I, that many of you have already heard. Like Gerald said, is that we wouldn't be Masons here if, we, if really there was no gold rush, or at least it would be much later. So we know by history that on January 24th, 1848, John Marshall discovered gold in Coloma. We were taught that. And when he uttered the words gold, it went like wildfire. Men literally dropped what they were doing back east, in Kansas, in Iowa, in Nebraska, Missouri, Louisiana, Texas, Washington, D.C. They ran here to find thousands of dollars in gold. Gold that was simply lying on stream beds, just to be picked up by the person kicking the gravel. We also know that when they got here, they brought two things that were very important for Masons. They brought the ideals of Masonry with them, and they brought their charters from where they came, whence they came. And those charters are very, very important. Because once they got here, and they're working the stream beds, and the rivers, and they bump into somebody, and they strike up a conversation, they realize that that person next to me is a Mason as well. And that guy over there, and this guy over here. And pretty soon, like Eureka 16 in Auburn, they built rudimentary lodges right on the stream bed. So they never had to leave the stream beds where they're camping. They go right in their little lodge, practice a ritual, and go back to mining. Well, eventually those went away, and towns started to grow. And they went into larger towns, towns like Grass Valley, Nevada City, Calaveras, Placerville. And they grew and grew larger. But, the, but these mason miners, for the most part, very few found gold. And they became hungry, and they had to take care of their family. So they had to fall back on their profession. Now, a lot of these were professional men, doctors and lawyers and engineers, architects. And a lot were freighters, retailers, and farmers, and ranchers. So they started to work, just to work to make money in the towns in the mother in the motherload in the foothills but even that wasn't enough and as lodges started to grow in the foothills they eventually moved down in, from the mountains into the valley and when i say valley i, I primarily talk about sacramento and the san joaquin valleys where towns were growing getting bigger and lodges were being built and were being bigger by these mason miners that immigrated into california and we know by history in april 19th 1850, the Grand Lodge of California was created by the first five lodges. And we know them now as Cal 1, Western Star 2, which is up in the Siskiyous, now is in the Siskiyous, Tehama 3, New Jersey 4, and Benicia 5. They came together at the Red House in Sacramento. They created the foundation of our Constitution that we have today and elected our, grand our first Grand Master. Now, it wasn't quite that easy. If you read the history, you know, and there are scholars here, you know that the formation of our first Grand Lodge was a couple, it took a couple times to have that happen. It was pretty controversial. There was, as you can imagine, a little infighting. But they did come together, and they did eventually form the Grand Lodge. So today, so today, I had created a lecture that I gave, I've given a number of times, to educate brothers and people, ladies, about the gold country itself, about me, my family, my roots, about the two lodges that I am very proud of, my home lodge in Madison 23, Nevada 13, and then a little bit about mining in itself, because I find as I talk, talk mining to, to some people, they look at me with a glass over eye like, you know, we, we've, been, we've read about it, but I've never seen it or touched it or really anything about it. So it's more of a, it's, a, it's, it's not an elevator talk like I'm giving now. It's going to be more of a lecture where I'm, I'm off my notes. 
and I'll have slides. And then once I'm done, uh, I can regale you. Know, I don't know how much time I have. I can regale you with a lot of stories. But if you have questions, please feel free to you know for questions. Any questions before I I get into this? Well, that's great. I love technology. Here we go. It's pretty nice, huh? Okay, let's make sure I got this going in the right direction. Yep. Let's talk about me a little bit, about where I'm from. I would suspect that most people here do not know where rough and ready California is. If you did, good chances we're related somehow. <laughs> <laughs> rough and ready is a historic and unique town I call home. It was the first settlement in what became Nevada County when Jonas Speck prospected up Deer Creek. Finding some surface gold, but eventually became a trader and cattleman in an adjoining area of Penn Valley. When quantities of gold was discovered in the nearby stream bed, the settlement, which was still as yet unnamed, grew to over a thousand miners. In 1849, a group of 10 settlers arrived after Jonas first laid eyes on the hillside. These men, who had recently been mustered out of the army with, with the end of the Mexican conflict, giving California back to the United States, which was known as the Hidalgo Treaty of 1848. The leader of the group was Captain A. A. Townsend, who had... So I've got to get, make sure I'm on the right track. That should be Zachary Taylor. It is. Okay, good. The leader of the group was Captain A. A. Townsend, who had fought with General Zachary Taylor in the Winnebago, Winnebago Indian Wars. General Taylor, who had a nickname of Old Rough and Ready, got the nickname because he handled the Indians in the roughest way and readiest manner. General Taylor eventually became our 12th president. Captain Townsend built his first cabin in the area and became, and, and because General Taylor would, had endeared himself to Townsend and the group of men in the vote of 1850, named the settlement after him to forever be known as Rough and Ready. By 1851, it had grown to over 6,000 souls, surpassing Grass Valley and Nevada City and only missed becoming a county seat by six votes. Many Im immigrants came to the area with a great number of Portuguese and English men and also a sizable population of Chinese. Most miners built a wood-sided cabin and used ship canvases for roofs. A devastating fire on June 28, 1853, reportedly started by a candle too close to a canvas, consumed most of the structures. But not to be deterred, the surrounding mining camps came to aid, and by November, most homes had been rebuilt of a more substantial manner. In 1850, a shrewd Yankee from back east trimmed a local miner by the name of E.F. Brundage in a substantial mining deal. Brundage, a local leader, while being upset for having been taken by the Yankee miner, declared that he would not live in a state with these so-called Yankees and called to order the move to succeed from the United States of America and form their own new republic of rough and ready. A town vote was taken and passed in April 1850 and a constitution was adopted and sent to Washington declaring that they no longer belonged to these United States, including paying any minor tax on their gold fund. However, all was not happy because there was by this time an annual 4th of July celebration in nearby Grass Valley. And all local miners from Rough and Ready enjoyed the events, especially the consumption of alcohol in abundance. However, once the Rough and Ready miners arrived to indulge in the splendid celebration in Grass Valley, they were promptly and severely turned away by the local townspeople, since they were not part of the United States, and therefore could not partake in any celebration. Since such news was a blow to the miners from the great Republic of Rough and Ready, they retreated to their town, quickly gathered in as many townspeople as they could, and had a vote. And with little fanfare, the Republic was disbanded, and a rejoining of the United States was in order, and soon thereafter, they arrived back in Grass Valley in time for their parade and their much-needed indulgence. So to this day, we still have what's called Succession Days in, in Rough and Ready. The interesting side part of that 
because they, uh, because of that, <coughs> because of their leaving the union in the way they did and just getting back together and giving a quick vote, the word never got back to Washington until 1945, which is why we could not have a post office because when we, when they made application for a post office, we did not exist because we didn't belong in the United States. So you can imagine the red tape back in Washington, D.C. So 1945, they say, okay, yeah, you guys are back part of the union. By the spring of 1854, a dispensation was adopted for a Masonic Lodge, and Rough and Ready 52 was formed by Grandmaster Radcliffe, issuing a dispensation in March 1854 for 20 men to meet and become Masons and follow a May Charter, and following a May Charter was then issued. By the next year, in 1855, there were 51 Masons attending, but by 1864, the numbers slid back to 25. Most miners had played out their gold finds and moved to richer fields. It was shortly thereafter that Rough and Ready Lodge 52 became extinct, leaving the few remaining members to affiliate with Madison Lodge 23. Rough and Ready 52 did, did produce a state senator by the name of Edward, Edward Williams, who served five years and who later became registrar of the United States Land Office in Sacramento. Mining the Rough and Ready was its, was its boom and eventually its bust. By the mid-1860s, most surface gold had been found and removed. One company reported earning $400,000 after their expenses from just one rich claim in over two years. However, most miners barely made a living. The real and substantial bust was that the area of the Reading set on the banks of an ancient Tesserary North-South River. The gold was deposited in the, in the gravel just under the surface, but there were no abundance of any quartz veins that would strike an underground mine which was found nearby in Grass Valley. In its early days, the Chinese numbered almost 3,000 laborers, having migrated mostly from the island of Macau. These laborers worked the heavy lifting on the tailing, tailing, tailing piles, removing the heavy stones so that the miners could sluice the underlying gravel. However, such poor were the wages for the Chinese, they would walk the sluices late at night, trying to find any leftover gold. That, produced, that practice led to the miners posting shotgun guards at their sluices and shot any wandering Chinese looking for an easy find. However, the miners were not all evil people and in the late 1800s took up a collection to send the last known Chinese worker to his home country of Macau to die pursuant to his wishes. The last known living Chinese laborer lived on my ranch. Well, at that point, my great grandfather's ranch in a, in a small dugout. And they, they got the money, and they didn't, he didn't have a name, they just called him Macau, and sent him to the island where he could die pursuant to his wishes. <coughs> However, even the devastate, with the devastating fires and the eventual move of the most miners, Rough and Ready would not ghost. The primary reason was that it set on the primary route between Sacramento and the mines of Grass Valley, and eventually became the safest route over the Sierras. Rough and Ready became a hub of all east-west transportation, although the population had blown over the last 1,700, and we have about 1,000 today. Let's talk a little bit about, about my family. One of the pioneering families that left the mark in Rough and Ready and in Nevada County was the Frank family on my mother's side of our family. In 1856, my great-grandfather, John Francisco, left his native land of Fayel and the Azores and finally arrived by ship in San Francisco around 1857 and eventually made his way to the Foothill Gulls, wanting, like all immigrants <coughs> of that time, to find his treasure. He arrived in Rough and Ready in the early 1860s, having heard of the number of Portuguese family mining in that area. Once there, he, along with a number of Portuguese miners, found the Portuguese Mining Company. They mined and remined many of the gravel beds and ravines. However, the gold was becoming scarce, and by 1865, the company was dissolved, and my grandfather bought out the remaining partners. In 1868, he became a U.S. citizen and shortened his name from Francisco to merely John Frank. In 1869, he sent for his lady Marie Felicia, and on July 14, 1870, they were wed and lived in that house, which is on my property. <coughs> Their wedding was only the 34th wedding to be recorded in the Book of Marriages in Nevada County. By now, there was a shortage of food in the area for the remaining townspeople, so he started to buy any remaining claims from the company and after which he sent a lawyer to the U.S. Land Patent Office in Washington 
and had the mining claims turned into land patents and started raising beef. I still have the original parchment signed by then President Rufus B. Hayes, our 19th president, who was the only person at that time that could transform claims into actual land patents. John Frank had 10 children, eight sons and two daughters. Subsequently, all left the ranch for other endeavors except one, Manuel, my, which would be, that would be the parchment. That's my granddad. Manuel was a middle child born in 1882. He worked the ranch until his passing in 1968, and from him came my mother Doris Tronner, which is my, my mom. That's my mom and dad, and I see that tree in that barn up my patio to this very day. The remaining ranch received numerous state awards for longevity, including becoming one of the only handful of ranches still operating in California with the same family in the same business for over 100 years. Our family ranch received such an award in 1957, since that, that was the time John Frank landed in California. Today, carrying on from my parents, I work the same land that is now over 160 years old. I still raise the same brand of beef as my great-grandfather, and the lineage of my cattle go back to that era. And often just, I just simply relax under the shade tree and just reflect on, on the place that I live. And that's one view of the ranch where I live. I believe few men have such sturdy and deep roots as I am blessed to have. So that's about my town, and that's a little bit about me. Let's talk about a couple of my lodges. These are important lodges. The first is Nevada 13. Gold was discovered by James Marshall in Coloma on January 24th, 1848, while clearing out a sawmill trace. Prior to Coloma, Marshall plaster mined on Deer Creek in Nevada City. And when, <clears throat> and when I say plaster mine, that is mining for gold in river and stream beds. He became, he was the first white man to work gold in, the, in that area that become, became known eventually as Nevada County. By 1850, over 10,000 gold seekers flocked into the surrounding hills. This is what it looks like today. As early as 1849, stores were built and cabins erected. At first, the area was known as Deer Creek Dry Diggings. But later, in March 1850, after the town was organized, the name of Nevada City was adopted as its permanent namesake. Shortly thereafter, Masonic Lodge was established, and Lafayette Lodge Number 29 hold its regular meetings and conferred degrees under dispensation from the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin. There was considerable controversy about the illegality of creating the Master Masons, which totaled over 13 in number. Their charter was dated April 20th, 1850, one day after the formation of the California Grand Lodge. Lafayette worked in good faith and aware of the new California Grand Lodge. On March 11th, 1851, a fire consumed all records in the lodge and the hall, and that news traveled eventually to the Grand Lodge. The Deputy Grand Master Tuck had ordered a dispensation to continue its work, and later at the end of communication, a charter was issued on May 6, 1851, with the name Nevada 13. So they actually were conferring degrees and making masons before Grand Lodge even existed. By the fall of November, at their semi-annual communications, Nevada 13 reported having conferred over 100 degrees and added. 23 Masons by affiliation. This lodge easily had the largest membership in the state at that time. By the end of 1852, California One, or Cal One in San Francisco took the coveted position of the largest lodge. And that came from that organization meeting at the Red House when lodges came together and eventually they vied for their position, so to speak based on the legality of their charters from other states. And that's once they proved that their charters of these lodges, like Benton City and Benicia, which was Benicia and Western Star, once they determined that these, the lodges they came from are in fact recognized by the Grand Lodge of England, 
then they could become the first lodge in California. In Meta 13, witnessed many mining events. It saw the crush of mining miners, plaster mining, in every possible drainage. From plaster mining, the advent of the hugely destructive practice of hydraulic mining came into being, where entire mountainsides were washed away to later fill a valley with debris called slickens. It also witnessed the beginning of our load or hard rock underground <coughs> mining in the neighboring areas. By 1858, Nevada 13 absorbed three nearby lodges, E.K. King Lodge 72, which lasted a mere three short years, Mansion 102 of North San Juan, and Quitman 88 of North Bloomfield. Of note, Quitman Lodge still exists. It's in a state park called Malakoff Diggings. And one of the, one of the priors of my year this year is to refurbish that lodge. It's, the building is there. Make it, again, very usable, as a and dedicated as a historical lodge, where especially the lodges up north can go and confer degrees in a true gold country era lodge in the hills. And that's what it looks like. In 1863, another destructive fire consumed the lodge and records of Nevada 13, but it bounced back a year later in the same building it currently houses. That chandelier, that's the inside look of Nevada 13. The chandelier is the original chandelier of 1850. Nevada 13 was known for its early charity in Mercy. It donated $250 for artificial legs for a brother named Bill Black, but said no to a widow who in 1882 applied for a monthly allowance due to her husband's being a passing. It was determined that she had a fortune of over $5,000 in the bank in the lodge, and in the lodge minutes, it was said a woman with that much money was not to be considered an object of charity. Remember, this is in 1882, that culture. Time marched on, and so did this frontier lodge. By 1892, the lodge was in, in dire straits financially. And some years before, the wealth of the gold drove the annual dues from 12 down to three dollars, and fixed the degree fee to fifty dollars. However, by 1892, the lodge was almost bankrupt and overdrawn, and finally, clear heads were veiled, and the end of dues raised to a mere $9, but it, that was enough to take it, itself out of debt. For its size, no other lodge in California by 1900 produced more public dignitaries than Nevada 13. It produced two grand masters, one senior grand warden, two junior grand wardens, two grand orators, one grand lecturer, two U.S. senators, one U.S. district court judge, and two judges of the California Supreme Court. That's a lot of dignitaries from a very small town. The first Grand Master was Charles Marsh. If you haven't seen, if you've not ever been into my little lodge, a brother by the name of John Dale is an artist. He now resides at, his unit at the Masonic Home in New City. He hand paints murals inside lodges. That's not a really good photo, but every time you look at a mural that he does, it's like finding Waldo. There's esoteric uh, paintings throughout it. It's an amazing, amazing work of art. <clears throat> Charles Marsh, who actually came to Nevada 13 from the consolidation of E.K. King Lodge. Born in Vermont in 1825, he became a civil engineer and came to Nevada City by 1849. And was instrumental in designing the first of an elaborate water delivery system for the miners. He was elected from the floor in 1852 to become a deputy grandmaster, but failed to become grandmaster the year following for we could not find a reason. It was not until 1868 he became grandmaster, presumably again from the floor. And it was not until 1873 he became master at 13. So he was already the past grandmaster when he became a master in my lodge. <laughs> The second was Edward Preston. He came to California in 1863 and after landing in Nevada City was at first a school teacher, <coughs> then superintendent of schools, then formed a local citizen bank in 1876, and finally became a state senator from Nevada County. He affiliated with Nevada 13 in 1873 and eventually became master. By 1889 he started, started in the Grand Line as senior grand deacon and eventually became the grand master in 1895. But what won him undying fame was that by resolution, he introduced and established an institution to take care of orphaned children of Masons. Everybody should recognize that building. 
Eventually, there was established the first Widows and Orphans Home at Dakota, which we know now as Union City, on October 14, 1896. And now it was actually finished in 1898. So the money originally set to create Dakota came from a grandmaster that was a past master of my little lodge. Niall Searles was born in New York, studied law, and came to California in 1849 for the gold rush. So, so far you can tell all these men are coming into California because of what? Because of the gold. He worked many jobs once he was in California, including buying and selling commodities, but eventually established a claim in the spring of 1850 south of Nevada City, which didn't produce any gold. He then ran an express business in the rugged mountains. That too proved to be too arduous and then opened a bookstore in Nevada City. There he reestablished a law practice and was elected district attorney in 1855, then judge of the local district, and by 1863 he was once again in private practice and became an expert in all aspects of hydraulic mining interest. He eventually became a debris com commissioner with the state and from there won an appointment to the state Supreme Court as Chief Justice of <coughs> California. It came in Nevada 13 from the consolidation of E.K. Kane in 1858. And in 1893, he became a grand orator and became one of the finest pleaders of our grand lodge. There is still in Nevada City the well known Searles Law Library. <coughs> William Bill Stewart was a Mason who rose to national prominence. He, like Searles, was born in New York, studied law, and got gold fever. He landed in Nevada City in 1849 and started a meager career in the mining that fizzled quickly. He then tried gambling with lack results. In the spring of 1852, he entered into law practice and became district attorney in Nevada County shortly thereafter. In 1854, he was appointed attorney general by Governor Bigler through their mutual friendship. He eventually moved to the state of Nevada, Nevada along with that Comstock silver rush at that time, and quickly became the greatest mining lawyer lawyer in the West. He practiced law for 40 years and during that time was also elected five times to the U.S. Senate and from, that, and from the now state of Nevada and became a personal confidant to President Lincoln and President Grant. With his mining experience, he fought and established the first national mining law in 1866 where a man who discovered a mineral deposit had the right to file a claim to hold it free. That wasn't all he did. He always had time for the little things that made for a closer human touch. One day while in Washington, he was approached by an old Virginia City acquaintance who wished to pursue a literary ambition. Stewart got this gentleman a job as a clerk for the U.S. Senate whereby this acquaintance could support his own ambition. That acquaintance we know today was Mark Twain and the literary ambition that he was writing was Innocence Abroad. And he, yet he was still not finished, and for even though he was a staunch northerner, he was a steadfast friend of the South. <coughs> By using his good judgment and statesmanship, he authorized and fought for and incorporated the 15th Amendment to our U.S. Constitution to prohibit the denial of the suffrage of public office based on race, color, or previous status as a slave. Thomas Caswell was another man born in New York, educated as a lawyer, caught gold fever, and brought him to Nevada City. He became the very first master mason raised in Nevada 13 Lodge. He was made an, an apprentice in Lafayette 29 in December 1850 and became a master mason in May 1851. Thomas Caswell was the very first elected county judge in a newly formed Nevada County in 1851. He was reported to be a fearless judge having presided over many contentious cases. His Masonic career brought him to the most, brought him the most honors of any Mason of the state in that time. He was elected Grand High Priest in 1858, Grand Recorder of the Royal and Select Masons in 1880, Grand Commander in 1873, and Grand Lecturer of the Grand Lodge in the same year. And in 1895, he was elected as Grand Commander of the Mother Supreme Council in the world, called the Scottish Rite. Obviously, he simply was a Mason that did not know how to say no. These are but a few of the important men who rose to Masonic prominence. Again, all started out as gold miners to search for their treasure, but only to find their calling in the lodge and the political realms. 
This is my home lodge, Madison 23. It has been said that no other lodge in California history has a more interesting history than Madison 23. It was a lodge that has been called a phoenix, having raised itself from devastating fires of 1852, 1855, and 1928. Being centered with Fort's mining town in Grass Valley, it has been described as the greatest mining town west, in the far west. In the book authored by Carl Glasscock in 1934, A Golden Highway. The very first miners appeared to have been three men from Oregon who drifted into the area from El Dorado in 1848. They found gold lying about in most stream beds and rock outcroppings. A year later, in 1850, the town first called Centerville was formed as more men heard of easy gold to be collected simply by walking the stream beds. Eventually, the town was named Grass Valley, going to the rich grass-filled valley where it was located. In the fall of 1850, a miner by the name of George McKnight stubbed his toe and fell while chasing one of his cows in the dark. <laughs> Having fell over that same rock before, he decided to get a sledgehammer and go out and break off the rock. Once he put a sledge to test, he discovered the rock was, in fact, a gold-filled quartz vein. Until then, gold was thought only to be found on the surface and in stream beds. A whole new era had dawned of underground or low mining, and within a few months, word got out and Grass Valley swelled to a flourishing mining town. By December 1851, many men who were masons from eastern lodges wanted to form their own lodge. In May 1853, a new communication of the Grand Lodge granted the masons their request from the previous 1851, wherein they wished to exchange their existing dispensations and were issued, that were issued from the Lodge of Grand, of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, and their request was eventually granted in May 1852 and chartered as Madison Lodge Number 23. The original lodge was held in a local schoolhouse, but the town fire of 1855 destroyed that building. Not deteriorated, rebuilt in a new temple, which was described as the finest building north of Sacramento. The walls were gilded and the ceiling painted as the very clouded as the actual clouded canopy of heaven. Paintings adorned the walls, and every detail was splendid. That building was admired until another devastating fire destroyed it and most of town in 1928. In Nevada County, in 1865, there were 13 chartered lodges, but most became extinct soon after becoming established. Only one lodge, Grass Valley 48, actually gained traction as a newly formed lodge. However, it only lasted a few months and never exceeded 14 members. Madison 23 has been memorialized in, past, in the past writings of 1900. Quote, Madison Lodge became being located in the heart of the Gold Ports mining region of Nevada County. The greatest portion of its members have been and still are engaged with sledge and drill in sinking deep into the treasure deposits locked in a crystalline rocks. Go down into the deep shafts and along the chambers you will meet brethren. Stripped to the buff, perspiration issuing in streams from every pore. Then go to the lodge room at night. And there, dressed in the garb of a gentleman of elegant leisure, you will find these same brethren in the east, in the west, and in the south, and around the lodge room, conducting the affairs and ceremonies of masonry with the true politeness and dignity, dignity and skill as if they were professors of colleges or universities. These same brethren can handle the gavel and trout with the same skill and facility that they do with the sledge and drills." End quote. Madison may not, have been, may not have produced the numbers of notable masons as his sister lodge in Nevada City, but it did have some characters of noteworthiness. One was Alonzo Delano. That's what the that's what the, it, the original lodge looked like, and it was truly a sight to behold. Delano was nicknamed Old Honest Block. He came to California in 1849 and settled in Grass Valley in 1851. He started in the mines, but soon settled as an agent for the local branch of Adams & Company, Express and Banking House. What was noteworthy was in 1855, the company came upon hard times and notified <coughs> Alonzo to default on any payments to the depositors. He defied that order, being feeling it was a rank injustice to the many good people whose life savings had been entrusted to their care. His immediate, he immediately called every depositor, informed them to come get their money dollar for dollar, and this very act won him the undying adoration of countless miners. Afterwards, he opened up his own bank 
and had many more depositors than he could ever have dreamed, is honestly earned him the name of Old Honest Block. Alonzo came as a Mason prior to arrive in California, became a Mason prior to arrive in California, but un unknown where he came from. We, couldn't, we still can't find out where he came from. Thereafter, his name appeared in the Menace of Madison in 1853 and remained until his death in 1874. Another fellow by the name of Edward Coleman arrived from England with his parents in 1846 and eventually made his way to California through the gold diggings in Nevada County in 1860. After various mining efforts, he finally became the manager of the North Star Mine and later, I have a picture of him, I don't. Uh, after various mining efforts, he finally became the manager of the North Star Mine and later organized the Idaho, Maryland Quartz Mining Company. These were two of the major load mines in the Grass Valley area. He was made a Mason in Iowa Hill in 1857 and eventually affiliated with Madison in 1865. He continued his Masonic career as becoming the Grand Treasurer and sitting as a member of the first Board of Trustees of what is now known as Union City Masonic Homes. His love for Union City was proved when he donated $40,000 to build a fully equipped hospital here. And finally, a story of Madison Lodge could not be complete without mentioning the fact that two produced two grandmasters. George Jones was born in 1873 to Dr. William Jones in Truckee and moved to Grass Valley where he grew up. George's father was subsequently memorialized by naming the first hospital in Grass Valley to his family name that was, it became Jones Hospital. It's still there. It is now a bed and breakfast. George was educated as a lawyer and eventually won election to become Nevada County's first district attorney, or became a district attorney in 1902. The year prior, he was made a Mason in Madison. His law career continued and he became a Supreme Court judge for Nevada County until he, until he retired in 1947. His love for the craft was answered when he was elected to junior grand warden and finally grand master in 1926 as our 60th grand master. He is described as it can only truly be said that George L. Jones had earned the respect and affection of every Mason in California, and his watchwords were to protect the integrity of Masonry, to preserve the dignity and high importance of Masonry, and to keep Masonry clean. Madison 23, and the other, the other Grand Master, I guess, would be me, if you're, if you're keeping track. Madison 23 still resides in its last building, heaven, been finished in 1938. The lodge was, is, and will always be a centerpiece for the, for the middle of our small town of Grass Valley. Looks just like that. Any questions about my history? Your it's pedigree deep. seems complete. Excuse me? Your pedigree seems complete. <laughs> my pedigree. Remember, masonry does not Look at men on pedigree, right? Yes. I had a question about um, Nevada 13 got their dispensation in May of 1850. Uh, they got their actual dispensation in, oh, yes, May of 1850, chartered in September. Mm -hmm. So San Jose Lodge 10 got their dispensation. Pardon me? San Jose Lodge number 10 uh -huh. got their dispensation in July of 1850 and their charter in November of 1850. I'm just curious as to why <clears throat> we had the lower number and you had yeah, the higher well, there again, those are some things that are lost to antiquity. Yeah. They truly are. Because if, you know, not to get off track, but if, if I had members of Wetch and Star number two here, they would argue to this very day that they are allowed, they should be Wetch and Star number one, not Calvin. Because they actually, they, they confirm that their charters from uh, Western Star Charter came from, nobody knows, help me out. I want to say, I want to say Missouri, I, I but, it was, Missouri. but it was confirmed to be a regular charter months before they confirmed Cal One, which was Benton City. But John Stevenson, the Grand Master, opted to go with Cal One instead of Western Star. Nobody knows why. It's just lost in antiquity. So I just want to say a few, oh, let, me, let me kind of switch gears. And I apologize for my drinking of water. I've, I've talked a lot this weekend and my throat's about gone. Um, 
a little bit about gold mining itself, the actual process of gold mining, which um, my, my, as I said, my great grandfather came here to mine gold, and then my dad was a gold miner for a couple years, and I'll talk about that. Since we have spoke on the interwoven relationship between local Freemasonry and the California gold rush, allow me to take a few minutes to familiarize you with some historical terms and facts of gold mining in my area. First, as gold was discovered in Colombo by James Marshall in January, it's actually January 24th, 1848, while he was cleaning out a, mill, a trail race on a sawmill, a trail race on a sawmill is, it collects the, saw, the sawdust uh, uh, and you're sawing the logs. I didn't know what that was. I looked at it. On a sawmill on the South Fork of the American River. Now, the American River, here's another satellite, you know, how it got its name. It's got its name, as I'm told and I read, from Indians that lived in the area because Americans were coming into the area down that canyon. So they called it the American River Canyon. The Americans. He noticed several flakes of gold. Marshall tried to keep this a secret, but as history showed, tens of thousands of gold seekers immigrated into the foothills of California. Most immigrated to areas throughout the Muggalove, in areas called, you probably you may have seen that at my installation speech, the Golden Chain Highway, it's Highway 49, and settled into small settlements and mining camps that eventually grew into towns from Vinton in the north, Vinton of Loyalton in the north, to Paul Kirsten in the south. So about 300 miles long, about 50 to 60 miles wide. Gold mining in Mugalo consist, generally consisted of three main types. Placer mining for surface gold in streams and rivers. Hydraulic mining, that's a placer mining. Hydraulic mining using giant water nozzles to wash the material from the sluicing and load or hard rock mining. That was a good photo, and if you ever saw that, that's actually all gold. You can only imagine how much something like that's worth. And I'll tell you a story about that. As one might guess, the first miners simply found gold lying in the rivers and stream beds, which they simply picked up. As in my area, the miners simply found gold where it lay, generally in or near water. Eventually, as that easy gold was exhausted, the invention of the gold pan came into bearing. The gold pan itself is actually a well thought out device. It is actually the most important device ever designed to extract gold from riverbeds. The gold pan itself is actually a, a thought out device, generally being made of metal, and generally between 17 and 24 inches in circumference, depending on one's own strength and endurance. The side walls is what proved the most difficult to determine. But through trial and error, the walls were between 35 and 45 degrees in the slope to provide an adequate swirl of the sand. So if you think about that, if it's too shallow, you wouldn't, the swirl would take all of the gold out. Too steep, nothing would come out. This proved to be an indispensable mining tool for some time until the implementation of the sluice box came shortly thereafter. A sluice box uses flowing water to wash material over small ripples set at about a 30 degree angle to create a small eddy. So you can, you got to, you got to, you got to, it looks like that. And so it would come down, it would eddy. <clears throat> Where the material swirls in a heavier gold sinks through onto a piece of burlap or perhaps carpet being trapped. In areas with abundant flowing water, sluice bosses became longer, up to 12 feet long. And these were called long toms. It had the same general idea where the box was set either in flowing water or water diverted into the box with the general drop of about one and a half inches per foot. The material was washed down to the end where a large ripple was waiting to capture the small nuggets into the burlap of the carpet. However, the, the sluice needed flowing water, and that was not always the case. It was then invented and developed the rocker box. The rocker box uses the same idea of washing material through a stream, allowing the heavy gold to become trapped into, in, into the uh, carpet or burlap. The rocker box was simply rocked from side to side, much like a baby's rocker, to move the material with the addition of water carried by bucket. 
This was arduous work since the walker boxes had to be constructed and moved often in difficult areas and both, and in both techniques the fine gold was never really captured, only smaller nuggets. This worked for a number of years until plaster mining for gold became harder and harder to find and larger amounts of material was needed to be washed from the hillsides. By 1852, the first water, water nozzle was invented. They used high pressure water to wash hillsides down into wading sluices. In Nevada County, the first known use of hydraulic mining with high pressure water was by a Frenchman by the name of Antonio Chabot. And by 1853, Edward Madison perfected the first strong, riveted iron nozzle called the water monitor to wash away entire hillsides. If, as I, if you remember, I talked about Quitman Lodge. It's in the state park called Malakoff Diggings. And if you are up in the Northern California, you have to be in my area. Go there because it's a beautiful state park, but you soon realize the destructive nature of hydraulic mining. What, what it, it actually changed landscapes. Whole mountainsides were gone. As this technique was perfected, great amounts of water was needed to be diverted from rivers and streams to push through these large monitors. In Nevada County, many remnants of hydraulic diggings remain with the largest being the town of North Bloomfield called Malakoff Diggings. Think of that as one time a beautiful forested hillside, which is not a state park. Also in this settlement, as I already mentioned, it was a Masonic Lodge named Putman Lodge. Think that's, that's, that's a view from coming into the park. That's just one small slice of the damage hydraulic mining did. There's that small lodge again. Quick, um, Another. Quitman Lodge was chartered in 1855, taking its name from the Grand Master John Quitman from Mississippi. Quitman Lodge was a raucous lodge in a remote area and at, at its height had amassed 45 members, mostly miners, and did produce a junior grand warden by the name of B.S. Olds. I don't know, I couldn't figure out what, the, what that stood for. <clears throat> we'll call him Bill for short. As higher and higher amounts of water were needed, Water companies were formed to create and engineer hundreds of miles of ditches and flumes to carry the water needed. The positive result of this was the fact that many companies were formed to create the first irrigation ditches in use today to bring raw water into these ranches and farms. The ditch that the water above my property is part of our local irrigation system that was designed as the flow of water into uh, into a sluice, and, and so that's it's a remnant of the mining area on my property. Eventually, tunnels were built to move the silt laden water from the mine areas and reroute this laden water called slickings back into the area of main river channels. By the 1880s, however, so massive were the amounts of silt laden debris being washed into the Sacramento Valley, the riverbeds had been filled all the way to the mouth of San Francisco Bay. Think of that. That's a long ways, and the Sacramento River is huge and they were full of debris. This caused the valley rivers to flood. There are now shallow banks ruining towns and farms. Eventually, a federal lawsuit was brought and the Federal Circuit Judge Lorenzo Sawyer declared in 1884 hydraulic mining illegal with a wanting discharge of silicons into their mines. With the Sawyer injunction in place, the hydraulic mining industry collapsed until 1893 when the Camietti Act allowed the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to regulate the discharge of hydraulic mines. So they still allowed it, but it was very regulated at that point. The first, the final technique of mining in our area was the hard rock mining, and by far the most productive and lucrative. As earlier described in the fall of 1850, George McKnight tripped over a, a stub of rock <clears throat> while chasing one of his cows, and upon breaking off that rock, discovered a coarse bearing vein and thus started the underground load mining revolution. There were many load mines in the area. In fact, there were 634. That map is the original load map of Nevada County hanging in my hallway. That map is from 1913. So from, from the onset to 1913, there were 634 claims of underground mines. I will focus primarily on one, which was named the North Star Complex, consisting of Idaho, Maryland, North Star, and Empire Mines. I don't know if you can see that. That's just a picture. Every one of those little boxes is a, is a, is a mine, is a claim. 
The interesting thing about that, that's all done by hand. It's hand -rated. There were many load mines in our area. In fact, I should stick in there. I was, oh, the miners knew that there were gold, that there was gold in quartz veins, but were faced with a daunting task of how to remove it from the ground. At first, rudimentary holes were sunk into the earth, following a, a quartz vein. The problem is that they could only be delivered a relatively short distance underground. Faced with not knowing how to mine underground, they collectively, their collective answers came from the Cornish miners of Cornwall, England. I just read, where's Charles? Charles had a book, has a book right there. Okay, well Charles had a book, I, I got this, I got this scam. And the deepest mine, deepest shaft that the miners could actually dig and shore up was 100 feet. They couldn't go beyond that. These English miners were, going back to Cornwall, these English miners were accomplished miners having mined tin deep underground for years in Cornwall. In 1840, a great mining depression struck Cornwall, and eventually the news of gold being discovered in California, the need for the, for the miners, brought the Cornish miners into our area. The local hard rock mines started to improve dramatically. Cornish mine miners sunk not vertical shafts, but rather 30 to 45 degree incline shafts. <coughs> the quartz gold days were followed as in the beginning, but now to much greater depths. Miners had, had miners hand drilled the rock face using simple sledges and drills. One man operation was known as a single jack. I have a picture I do right there. And two man teams were called a double jack. Once the ore was blasted using at first simple black powder, and then later came the advent of giant powder. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. That's, that's, that's called a mine phase. That is very specific on how that was drilled and punched by what's called a powder man. Once the ore was blasted through using that first simple black powder and then dynamite, the development of a stamp mill was used to crush the rock into even smaller and smaller pieces. That's what a, that's what a blast of gold quartz looks like. Comes a stamp mill. These stamp mills were generally five to as many ten stamps to a set. Each stamp rod was ended with a piece of solid iron weighing 600 pounds. Each rod was in turn attached to a cam with the entire stamp shaft being turned at first with steam engines, then water through a pulp mill, and eventually by electric motors. The rod only traveled about ten inches and fell under the rock much like a piston in a car's engine. At the height of these large mines, the deafening sound of stamp mills shook houses miles away to a point some mine companies had to relocate the townsfolk. The resulting crushed ore was subsequently crushed to a size of a beach sand, in many cases as small as fine powder. Once crushed, the now pulverized ore had to be mixed with a substance to extract the gold from the, from the uh, rock, the rock finds. It was discovered that when mercury was added to the ore, it formed a slurry. It would bind chemically to only the gold. The slurry called a mabin balls of mercury and gold were then heated in a retort oven. I got a picture of that. What <coughs> they look like? The mercury had a much lower melting point and vaporized, <coughs> vaporized at 800 degrees. The vapor then rose into a water jacket pipe, condensed, and was then captured back for use. The remaining dirty gold was again heated to melt away the other impurities and eventually poured into 89-pound bricks, assay for purity, and shipped in a San Francisco mint. When the underground mines were first started, as stated earlier, steam power was used, and during the first era of mining underground, when steam power, during the first era of mining underground, when steam power was used, huge amounts of wood was required to generate the steam. Note, that's, that is the Empire Mine, and if you notice, the significance of this slide is that there's very few trees. The Empire Mine alone consumed 11 cords of wood per day to run the steam engines, oh. and for the stamp, to compress it in the hoist machinery. And it illustrated quarter firewood is a stack four foot wide, four foot high, and eight foot long. And they did that by hand every day. The entire surrounding areas of Grass Valley and Nevada City were almost completely denuded of, of trees that furnished with firewood. In fact, Nevada County Narrow Gauge Railroad was devoted and developed and voted to connect to Colfax, the 
about 14 miles away. Again, look, there are, there's simply no trees. They had, look, the, the bare hillsides. They created this narrow gauge railroad to go to Colfax, a neighboring town, to transport timber and firewood from the forest and later passengers and commodities. And remember, there were only a hundred, there were hundreds of underground mines in operation during the first startup period, all needing, all needing timber and wood. The picture. That, that was torn down when I was a kid in 1960. It was there for years. Not for the faint of heart. So trees have grown back. Now we're, we're very well forested again. As the mines became deeper, water became problematic. At first, buckets carried away the water in a very efficient way, inefficient way. The Cornish miners developed what was known as the Cornish pump. Oh, I just want to see, see that's, that's coming into Nevada City. It's well treated now. The Cornish miners, this, was, this is how load mining actually succeeded. It proved efficient, but it had its own limitations. It, in simple terms, it was made of a large timber piece that joined to form one long rod. On the end was a pump head that would cycle up and down in six foot increments. The great weight of the pump, if I have a picture, that's what it looks like. The great weight of the pump end would push down into the collection stump, force water back up into a collection pipe with a one way valve. In other words, just think it's, it's like a plunger, pushing the water down, forcing it back up this other pipe. And it would have a one-way valve, and we would just keep pushing it up, keep pushing it up. In a diversion tunnel, and up to 18,000 gallons a minute. Miners also found that at about the 400-foot 400 le 400 level, and that's what the pump looks, it just pushes it down, forces the water back up through a one-way valve. What they found also is that massive air compressors were developed to pump huge quantities of air into the mine shafts. They found that sufficient air could not get below 400 feet. Now these, these mines were down to 3,000, 3,500 feet. Air shafts were then developed to create a natural evacuation for the pumped air in the surface. Every mine had a number of air shafts. To this very day, we still have problems in Grass Valley, Nevada City, of people will buy a piece of property, everything is fine, but then they look out and their garage is gone, or their car is gone, because the air shaft had collapsed unbeknownst to the landowner, mm -hmm. and now they're stuck with a huge problem because there was litigation years ago to absolve any mining uh, partners of any, uh, any liability of these, these uh, air shafts. <coughs> Miners were first, walk were first walking back and forth in and out of the incline shafts, but later developed what's called man skips on the rails to lower and raise up to 20 miners at a time. This led to the ever-increasing use of the main hoist with up to 8,000 feet of cable. I can't even imagine getting on that. The cable went from the hoist drum up and over a massive wooden, or what's called the head frame, and then down the inclined shaft. Ore carts were raised and lowered in the same manner with a secondary cable system. At first, steam was used to drive the hoist, then came the pelt and water wheel to drive the hoist, and finally electric motors were used. A series of bells were used to tell the hoist operator and to, to stop or to continue and what depth they had reached. The hoist could travel over 600 feet per minute up and down 1,200 feet per minute, not for the faint of heart. The mine structure was almost like a road system. There was the main incline shaft, and from its side tunnels or drifts were tunnel following gold veins. Some drift tunnels had followed veins for miles. A raise is where a drift tunnel went and started to turn up. A stoop is a drift tunnel that ore had been removed. In each case, every few feet, drill holes were made in the rock face and insert by a certain design, black powder, then dynamite, was used by a black by a powder monkey to blast and set it off. After the air cleared, only the mine boss for that level would determine the gold was found. Then the muckers were sent in to fill the ore carts, which carried one ton, these were one ton of ore carts, and they had a mucker, which was my dad. Every person that started in a mine was a mucker. They had to fill one ton in six minutes. That was, that was their standard. The carts were first pushed by hand, but soon mules were introduced to pull up to eight loaded carts at a time. These mules, many of them, never saw daylight, except to go to turn around and go back down. They were actually, many of them were born down in the shafts and they were raised 
down on side tunnels. Eventually, the motors were aided in moving the carts and the, and the mules were no longer needed. The carts were then sent up in the main shaft, dumped in, in the mine trolleys and sent to the surface to the head frame, dumped as waste or ore, and the ore then went to the stamp mill. As the largest mines were developed, over 360 miles of tunnels were dug under the town of Grass Valley. The deepest inclined shaft was 11,000 feet deep. Now, Grass Valley sits around 2,500, 3,000 feet, so well below sea level. Pardon me? Which placed the vertical depth, the vertical depth, now 11,000 feet long, incline, vertical depth is over 5,200 feet, over a mile deep. With all the development in this industry involved in a deep mine, depths and, deaths and injuries were actually quite few. Cave-ins were rare due to the nature of it because it was all solid rock, and most injuries were a result of blasting or equipment failure. At the time of its closing in 1956, after working for 100 years, the Empire Mine produced 5.8 million troy ounces of gold, or 181 tons, with a value of, back then, $160 million. Nevada County was the richest gold producing county in the motherload, having produced over $440 million in gold, with an average gold price back then of $27 an ounce. At today's current market of around $1,500 per ounce, the value soars well over $2 trillion. At the, at the Empire Mine, the mine owner, William Bourne, lived a lavish life in this mansion, which is still there. Many fine structures were erected all through this area, and they were for dances and dignitary parties, yet William Bourne never invited any miner to step foot inside there. They were true the elite. <laughs> so, let, let me continue a couple of slides. How much time have I got? How much time would you like? Okay. Well, I, I mean, I can tell you, you look at audiences, you know. <laughs> a couple things. Some personal side stories. My dad came from Colorado, and when he was 17, he had to be 18, but when he was 17, he lied and was allowed to go into the Empire Mine. This mine, right? That mine, that last mine. Like any young man, you go in as a mucker, the guy that shovels that ore. Remember, that, now that, my dad was a skinny kid, but he had to maintain one ton of ore in six minutes. I have no idea how he did that. And often when I was being raised and I'd complain about something, my dad would remind me that he could shovel one ton of dirt in six minutes. Why can't he do that? But after he did that for a while, he then was approached by the mine boss. Now, a mine boss or shift boss is at every level in a mine. And there could be dozens of these. The mine is, the powder monkey, powder monkeys blow a face. Only person that goes because they call everyone back. The supervisor goes in to determine if there's gold there. Well, one day, my dad was approached by a mine boss because back then there was a huge issue about William Bourne sending, let's call them snitches, down into the mine to find the difference between company men and the rank and file because there was a lot of high grading going on. Remember. The men were strip search going in and strip search coming out. They were still high grading a lot of gold. History now tells us most of the high grading of these mines came from the shift bosses, the guys that would go in and determine if there's gold. They were the perfect guys. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this, this gentleman brought to my dad a beautiful quartz nugget and told him, said, if you are truly not an administrative guy being sent here by William Bourne, meet me tonight at 10 o'clock at this particular location in Grass Valley and give me this same piece of gold. My dad, my dad, he's just a kid. How do I get it out? So I'm not going to tell you how to get it out. So to this, my dad never would tell me how he got it out. But there, he just said there's a lot of gloves with missing fingers, right? Okay, so dad got it out. Brought it to the guy, and the guy said, you know what, his name was Tommy. Tommy, you're truly one of the, one of the, one of the good guys working the mine. Therefore, 
He gave it back to my dad. My dad gave it to his mom, my grandmother. And she made it into a ring that I have in my safe, a beautiful fourth ring. So that's my direct memento from my father's time. Going back, way back, my great grandfather. There was no load mining in Rough and Ready, it was plaster mining. And as I just said, the money he made was raising beef that I have today. So that's, so we, if you listen to the, those prominent men, they all came here for gold. But they never, none of them found riches. They became something else. But they were all masons that become, either they came, either they came as masons or became masons. The guys that really formulated the base of the Grand Lodge came as masons with their church. So that's the, the history of gold mining in the motherland. And that's why I'm trying to highlight up and down the state, because I want all the brothers to understand where we came from. Because I had a, a meeting years ago, and I asked a question with a, a, a great scholar to give a history of the Grand Lodge of England. I, and I simply asked the question, where did California Freemason come from? Where did the Grand Lodge of California come from? And the resounding answer that everyone gave me was, <coughs> came from San Francisco. Well, that's not true. The oldest lodge that we have now, and there's some controversy on its number, is resides in San Francisco. But we came from the immigrant miners that came from the different the Midwestern states with their charters and eventually formed the first five five lodges. Okay? So questions? <coughs> 